Today we're here with New Orleans Health Innovators, NOLA High, and today we have presentations from three high quality startup companies from across the country, and they were focused on the diabetes challenge. Working together with Oshner Health System and Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana, they basically provided a challenge and said, hey companies, can you help solve that? And the reason why the New Orleans Business Alliance got involved was we wanted to make sure that not only when we do economic development, we attract companies and attract financial and human capital investment, but we also want to solve problems and improve the lives of our friends and neighbors. And what we're really here to do is to look for solutions for one of the major problems for us in the state, and that's the care of diabetics, which is a, which is a chronic disease that has uh, really um, put some challenges for, for us in keeping our members healthy. Healthcare is in great need of transformation. Um, and not all great ideas will be coming from within healthcare delivery systems. We need the public, we need startups, we need a lot of thoughtful ways to try and improve the care of our population and these type of innovation challenges can help stimulate those kind of activities. Chronic disease is one of the major scourges of health and health and well-being for our citizens. Diabetes is about the, we're about fifth in the country in terms of the incidence of diabetes per capita, so Blue Cross is doing many things to try to improve the care of those patients. We look to keep those patients healthy, to keep their diabetes under control so they can lead uh, healthy and happy lives. We're interested in all types of solutions, but diabetes is a particularly big problem in the Gulf South and in Louisiana. It's one of the largest contributors to chronic disease burden and hospitalizations and death in our region. And we need new novel ways of caring for these patients. We make smart insoles that can early detect the formation of a diabetic foot ulcer. And how serious a problem is this? It's a huge problem. Uh, there's actually 200 amputations per day in the United States due to diabetic foot ulcers. And tell us about the product that you developed. Sure. So we've used uh, patented nanotechnology to make thin film temperature sensors, which can give over a two-week lead time to give an early warning about the possible uh, formation of a diabetic foot ulcer. What kind of response have you seen so far? Oh, it's been terrific. Um, we've got 100% take up from podiatrists that are very interested in using it and the diabetic patients too are also very interested in having their daily foot monitoring uh, in a seamless fashion so they don't have to uh, do it proactively. We've partnered with this other company Quick Kicks Hands Free Shoes which made the first totally hands free operable footwear that allows people to easily step in and they automatically fasten without the need to bend over use their hands because a lot of Diabetes patients also have other mobility conditions that make it difficult to put on footwear. So our insoles fit right in the shoes, and then you step in and close up, and then they monitor the health of the patient's foot continuously. My company is Allergy, and I basically formed the company after my wife almost went into a diabetic coma. I got upset about it and decided to do something about it and I treated it like it was a NASA a DARPA project and found out that the work I was doing with the military, all that underlying science was a solution to a problem that 20 years of people have not been able to, to accomplish. And so that's where we're at now. We have a working prototype and I'm looking forward to working with the people here in Louisiana to test it out and help manage diabetes. Tell us how your prototype works and how it can help patients. Basically, the prototype is a wristband device that has a sensor in it that monitors the blood glucose levels as the blood glucose passes uh, through the sensor field. The information is sent to a smartphone. The smartphone then allows them to access not just their blood glucose level, but also the trends, whether it's going up or down. In the event that they become distracted and they're not paying attention, if their blood sugar goes low, it will send them an alert and say, look, your blood sugar is low. Do something about it. If they gets too high, the same thing. If they don't pick up and act on the alert, it then calls their loved ones and says, hey, I'm having a low blood sugar attack. I'm at this location. Check on and make sure I'm okay. What we basically do is uh, provide digital solutions for patients and providers to uh, basically better manage diabetes. We're almost like an endocrinologist by your shoulder in the fact that we help analyze the patient's numbers for you and make uh, FDA and uh, guidelines-based recommendations to help with the patient's care. How does the uh, program work for the patient? Uh, all the patient has to do is basically download the app, set up an account, uh, connect it with their care team, and all, all they really got to do is just punch in their numbers, their glucose levels, which will be transmitted back to the provider. 
What kind of results have you seen so far? Oh, fantastic. We've done a lot of uh, studies at the Atlanta VA and Emory so far. We've seen uh, improvements within three to six months, sometimes as early as a, mo a month, getting patients to go and sustaining them at goal for about uh, a year or so. I'm Quentin Messer, Jr. I am the president and CEO of the New Orleans Business Alliance, and it is with great pleasure that Business Alliance and the team, and I will have a chance later in the program to thank all of them personally so you can see them, to welcome you to the pitch finale of the New Orleans Health Innovators Challenge. Uh, this is our first year of doing this, and this has really been a tremendous journey. Uh, you may ask, well, what are you, why are you doing this? And there really is really three significant reasons. The first, we believe fundamentally that in order for New Orleans to be the type of city that all of us want it to be, we have to begin to ensure that we have more entrepreneurial companies come and grow here in the city. Secondly, there is a tremendous opportunity here in the healthcare industry. We have tremendous companies, you'll hear about them, we have tremendous partners. We believe that a city that is going to be successful is a city that fundamentally solves problems that affect the human condition. And then finally, we really believe, and Sally alluded to it, that New Orleans is really on the precipice of becoming one of the major meccas for entrepreneurial development. And we just see this as an opportunity to flow um, into a significant part of that, which is digital health, and which is a significant emerging field. So during the first year of NOAA, we encouraged submissions for digital health solutions in three areas. Diabetes care, presented by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana, an Oshner health system. Second, patient navigation by Tulane Health System. And third, data interoperability by Lafayette General Hospital. So we fundamentally are doing what a lot of companies say to us, hey, is a big problem. It's easy, sometimes it's easy to find money. It's not always easy to find partners with whom to pro um, provide proof points and data points in order to make sure that you have market validation. That's what we're doing for these companies. So we partner with our region's legion, uh, leading healthcare institutions and MedStar, I have to give a shout out to Alex and his team, there was the, in, the interface and the infrastructure backbone and issued a national call for the best and brightest solutions to these three challenges. And once you hear their pitches, you will see proof positive why these are some of the best and brightest companies in, in, in our nation. We gave everyone a voice, and we have an expert panel of online judges, as well as crowd interaction through MedStarter's community voting platform. The finalists who are present today are among the best of the best and have been vetted at multiple points. Some of you may have heard me say, and I've said this a lot, and our staff understands this, and I think all of you do, is that economic development matters only to the extent that people matter. If you grow the economy, if you change the economy, but people's lives aren't enhanced, you haven't really accomplished anything. And we think that there is no fundamentally important area in which to change people's lives is to make sure that their health outcomes are improved. And these companies that you hear about today are going to help us do that. And so these companies are examples of the type of innovative and disruptive thinking that happens in New Orleans and has happened in this city for almost 300 years. You can't be the birthplace of jazz or Creole cuisine or a number of other things without disruptive innovation thinking. So we think that this fits right in very nicely with who we are and who we have been. So without further ado, let me begin with not only the CEO of Innovation Auctioner, but also a board member for the New Orleans Business Alliance. We thank her for her service. I'm gonna turn it over to Amy Quirk. Give her a round of applause. Thanks, Quentin. Thanks, Quentin. Um, again, my name is Amy Quirk. I'm the CEO of Innovation Auctioner, or IO, as we like to call it. Um, on behalf of IO and Auctioner Health System, thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, I want to thank Mayor Landrieu and the New Orleans Business Alliance, Quentin, and the entire team um, for their vision in hosting this event, um, and to the Idea Village and Sally and her whole team for giving us a platform to do it during New Orleans Entrepreneur Week, such a wonderful festival of new ideas and new thinking in the city. Um, Oxner is dedicated to changing and saving lives in the Gulf South through innovation, collaboration, and inspiration. Our history and culture of exploring new and different approaches to care is as much a part of our DNA as our group practice model. 
Our commitment to innovation is as strong as ever from our newly announced first in the nation work using artificial intelligence that came out last week during HIMSS to improve patient care, as well as to our ongoing commitment to New Orleans and entrepreneurship through NOE. We know that integrating smart technology and data into the way care is delivered can help us create patient-centered solutions that will make the experience and delivery of healthcare better and our communities healthier and stronger, as Quentin said, while lowering costs. We've been taking on chronic disease, including hypertension, diabetes, and heart failure. They present a real problem, particularly here in the Gulf South, where the prevalence of chronic disease is the highest in the nation. These diseases affect our families, our friends, and our neighbors every day. And we've got to be relentless about solving them. As the largest healthcare system in the Gulf South, that's what we're doing every day. A shared vision to work together to improve the health of our state was the impetus behind our partnership with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. And the reason decided, we decided to partner together to sponsor this NOLA Health Innovators Challenge. By coming together to solve some of healthcare's biggest problems, like chronic disease, we can make New Orleans, this region, and our state as a whole healthier and stronger. And so with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana, we put out a call to the entrepreneurial community around the country to bring their ideas, creativity, and new thinking to help improve diabetes care through the NOLA High Challenge. I'd like to introduce our partner, uh, Dr. Vindell Washington, who has worked with very closely with us on this challenge, who will tell you more about the Diabetes Care Challenge. Thanks, Amy, and thanks for the, int the introduction. I'm uh, Vindell Washington, and I'm pleased to serve as the Chief Medical Officer of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana. I'm really excited about today. Um, I had a chance to serve uh, along with uh, Samesh Nigam from Blue Cross Blue Shield <clears throat> and the great group from Ochsner as we uh, did some pre-selection uh, for the challenge that we're gonna discuss today. And Blue Cross Blue Shield and Ochsner really wanted to partner on this challenge because we both recognize that innovation will be critical to changing the way that we deliver care. We, we're excited to work together new ways to improve health outcomes, to lower costs, and to provide better experiences through uh, care delivery systems in our state. I wanna thank the New Orleans Business Alliance for the opportunity to, to be a part of NOLA High and for their support in carrying out the Diabetes Care Challenge over the past several months. I'd also like to thank Karen DeBlue and um, Scott Whitaker for joining us on the panel. Uh, we're excited to have you join, and we're excited for this, uh, the, the activities that are to come just in a few moments. So the question may be, why did we focus on diabetes? You know, really, it's such a prevalent disease for us in Louisiana. We're actually fifth uh, in terms of prevalence uh, in the country, and it's the le leading cause of death with its sequela for our citizens, and so we thought it was important to take a look at it. And, but while diabetes is really a condition that can have devastating effects, it's also one that with the right care, support tools, uh, and support from caregivers that you can get control of and help people live uh, better lives and manage that disease more effectively. So we embarked on this challenge looking for digital solutions that would empower patients with diabetes to do just that, lowering the stress and helping them get more confident about self-care and staying on top of their condition, their devastating condition. So the finalists whom you'll hear from in just a little while are pitching some new and dynamic interventions, and we're really encouraged by what they've come up with, and we're proud to be here to have that um, share, shared with you and look forward to the pitch debts to, to come. So on that note, I'll turn it back over to the New Orleans Business Alliance so we can move into the pitching portion of the program. Thank you, Dr. Washington. So before we start the pitch program, I'd like to introduce our panel of elite judges. Uh, more extensive bios of them are in your programs. Um, so please, you can read about them later. We are truly, truly, truly honored that they took time out of their busy schedule. You already met Dr. Vindell Washington, the Chief Medical Officer of Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Next is, he referenced his colleague, Dr. Samesh, Nagam, Senior Vice President, Chief Analytics and Data Officer at Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Please raise your hand, sir. Thank you. 
And then we also have Dr. Richard Milani, Chief Transformation Officer, Oshner Healthcare System. Rich? Joining him is Dr. Bo Raymond, Medical Director, Oshner Physician Partners. Bo, please raise your hand. And next we have Karen W., who is the Southeast Louisiana Market President at Capital One. Karen, please raise your hand. And rounding out the panel is Scott Whitaker. He's one of the senior attorneys at Stone Pigment. Please raise your hand, Scott Whitaker. All right, well, let's get the show on the road with our first finalist from the Sunshine State, um, my home state. They're from a little bit further south on the Space Coast. We have Allergy, and they're improving diabetic health through innovation. So please give a round of applause to our team from the Sunshine State, Allergy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really would like to say to the people that made this possible, um, we're honored to be up here to talk about our, our technology. I'll tell you how I wound up getting here. <clears throat> about two years ago, I woke one Sunday morning and I noticed that my wife was in, in bed. Normally she likes to sleep in on Sunday and I called her name out and there wasn't any response. So I got up and I walked over to the living room and she was sitting on the couch, staring into space. And I go, good morning, Sue. How are you doing? No response. She was catatonic. And I realized, oh my gosh, she's having a low blood sugar attack. So I uh, got some orange juice, and I gave it to her. And she drank it. And like 10 minutes later, she went, oh my god, Mark, wh where am I? And I said, Sue, you're at home. You just had a low blood sugar attack. But you're OK. Everything is fine. It wasn't. My father died from it. His brother died from it. And here I was. If I wouldn't have woke up when I did, she would have gone into a coma. And I said, I'm going to do something about this. I was a former director of engineering for Stanford Research Institute Space and Marine Technology Group. And as such, I was a program manager to develop technologies using electromagnetic sensing to look for things in seawater environments. Little did I realize that the very things that I did for DARPA and for special forces, that those technologies that we developed to do the impossible were something that made something that was impossible for the last 20 years something that we can do. And I knew how to do it. What's the problem? You know. We have like 422 million diabetics on the planet. I didn't realize how big the problem was. And we're using technology that's 20 years old. Blood glucose oxidase, basically a chemical reaction to give us the numbers. I know and I knew from all the work that I did there was a better way to do this. So we came up with a, a device that uses a sensor, dielectric, spectrometer to measure blood glucose real time as it passes through the wristband of your body. And I can now take a picture of your entire dielectric spectrum of which one component tells you what your blood sugar is. <clears throat> we basically developed a four-dimensional technology in dielectric spectroscopy using vector-based data and we we're able to uh, pretty much do the thing. As far as the FDA approval process is, it's a straight 510k process. Uh, our FDA counselors basically have told us we can accomplish that fairly quickly. It's a totally scalable system, and business model is very scalable. Lots of competition, but we got something that nobody else has. And a killer startup team, so thank you. Terrific presentation, thank you, and glad you saved your wife. Um, question about the feasibility of the, of the product. Is it, is it available to all? Is it affordable for all? And how does the insurance part of this factor in? So basically, the, uh, it turns out I can manufacture the device for less than uh, $35 a piece. Um, <clears throat> it would fall into the same category as the glucometers do these days as far as reimbursement is concerned. Um, it's probably going to cost less uh, because we don't have the consumables uh, that, you know, my wife spends at least $100 a 
a month after the insurance pays for what they pay for. So it, that's the whole point, to make it affordable. We have a working prototype here. Uh, Ryan is part of my A team. Ryan, why don't you stand up? Uh, <clears throat> if you look at his arm, basically what we've done is we've taken that refrigerator size spectrometer and that little box on the side of it is, is what it turned, we've been able to modify it to develop it to do that. The next generation will be a wristband device. But the hardest part was doing that. Miniatures, miniaturizing it is not a challenge. It just takes money and time. So can you give us any idea of field testing? I mean, in other words, have you looked at this compared? There you go. All right, this is what all the guys want to see, Clark Air Grids. And then there's a new one they came out with, which we have as well. So the preliminary data that we've gotten is really exciting. Uh, it, it really, I, I'm so happy and proud that we were able to, my A team was able to make this thing work. And uh, so we're looking forward to working with you guys here in Louisiana to get this kind of data real time from all the people here that have diabetes and be able to make sure that trending is the most important thing because the problem my wife has is she doesn't know if she's going higher or lower. She gets one point in time with the glucometer. So here, she can look at it and say, oh, it's going up, well, so, you know, I don't have to worry about eating. Or it's really going down, so I better eat something. Because right now, she has to guess. And if she guesses wrong, she starts getting this, this up and down, which is the worst thing you can do. So that's, that's one side of it. The other side of it is, if something happens, it automatically alerts her if her blood sugar goes too low. And if she doesn't pick up the phone, it calls me and tells me, this is where I'm at. I'm having a low blood sugar attack. Please come and help me. And that's why I did this, because I wanted to not have her to go to sleep and not for me to be able to do something about it. Mark, following up on that question, uh, how long do you think your timeline is to get to um, accuracy that will be accepted by the clinicians? Well, basically, we're there right now. This data here, these lines here, sorry, I'm not supposed to go into it. This doesn't get any better. So you think you're there now, even yes. though there's uh, people's bodies change and uh, you know those sorts yes. of, of, of variables uh, occur. Yes, you think because you're there. What, what we're doing is when we do the calibration, each calibration for every individual, you have a different chemistry. You have a different stuff in your wrist. You may be heavy. You may be thin. So when we calibrate the system, it's calibrated to your body, and so we can then get accurate data. The other thing that's really neat is we're taking a whole spectrum. So the potential is that we may be able to pick up other things that are happening to your body, changes that you're not even aware of. For instance, the English used this technology to look for mad cow disease. It is more sensitive than bioassays. It has less false, positive, less false negatives. So there could be other things that we can pick up as we learn more about people and how their chemistry changes that can help us in addressing things before they become obvious and, and it's too late to do something about it. Mark, one question I have. Uh, this definitely competition from um, continuous glucose monitoring devices that are in place where you make one prick uh, and keep that patch on, uh, they're small. So while you've replaced the, the prick portion, but this looks like the size of the device is still pretty large, uh, just comment on that. What is the potential for reducing the size and, and really competition with devices such as the, what so, Dexcom So the, the challenge from an en engineering perspective is minimal to reduce the size. So um, we already have talked to Jable and a couple other major OEM manufacturers and also medical device manufacturers, and the size reduction is not an issue. It's about money to, to do it. You, you have to pay a good amount of money to take things and shrink them to a chip level size. But it's definitely 100% doable. And as far as the other devices that are out there, they're temp you have to replace them constantly. All right, like Dexcom, you have to actually rip the damn thing out every week and put a new one in. So that's invasive. I don't care if you say you don't, you don't have to prick yourself. You still have to do that process, right? So everybody out there is not able to see the spectrum either. They're just looking at one thing. They're still using this chemistry approach. We have a way of looking at your entire spectrum that can show other things besides just the diabetes. So uh, what you're doing is fantastic, so I'll commend you on that. Uh, regarding the testing that you've done there, was that just simply at rest, or have you done it with activity to see if, you know, if, you, if you're exercising, does it change how well it reads and the like? 
Yeah, so right now we're going to be going through those, those types of tests with NASA. We, we want a, a technology docking uh, program uh, with them. And they have a whole physiology section at lab where we can do the exercise tests and everything else under a very controlled environment. But those are things that we, we need to, to, to go through. But I'm confident based on what I know, um, based on technology and, and how we're doing this, that you know, we, we shouldn't have a problem with those things. Just one more quick question. Um, super exciting um, activity that you're outlining. But um, on this sort of dielectric spectrum work that you're talking about, is there any um, testing or literature on really what happens at the extremes on the blood sugars? So both, most of those are either clustered around something that is not sort of either. You know. Yeah, so that's what we're doing now. I actually volunteered to do an experiment for my, my product manager, Ryan. Ryan said, look, Mark, I'd like to get some data up in the over 200 range. So I, I drank a 44-ounce Slurpee, and I ate two Boston cream donuts. And I figured, well, if this doesn't do Sacrifices it, because I'm, for science, I'm, I'm probably borderline diabetic. So, so uh, when we do our calibration, Ryan takes three different glucometers, and we use that because there's such variability in those glucometer readings, plus or minus 20%. You know, that's crazy, but that's what it is. So we take the average. And he looks at me after he took the samples. He says, are you feeling OK? And I go, yeah, why? He says, two of them say hi. You pegged the damn things. And the other one says 580. And I went, oh my god, I'm going to get a stroke. So like my wife, I grabbed a gallon of water, and I drank the gallon of water. I brought it down to 300. I called my doctor. I've got diabetes. Oh no, don't self-diagnose. Come in and see me. So I did the tests. And sure enough, he says, I'm sorry, you're diabetic. And I said, yeah, no, sh you know, I, I know, right? So, so little did I realize that I was one of 9 million people that have diabetes, and I didn't even know it. Thank you so much. I Thank appreciate you. it. Please give a round of applause. Now we want to welcome our next company from Bon Bhutan from New York, New York. Please, we're going to have Steve Kaufman and Lynn Lee. Is it just going to be Steve? Steve? Steve is all you need. Come on, Steve. Yeah. Lynn Lee, founder and CEO of Bombaton. His and another team member's wife were diagnosed with gestational diabetes, so they know firsthand the daily challenges that it presents. But what about the long-term patients with diabetic neuropathy who can no longer feel their feet? They're at very high risk for developing foot ulcers, which happens to about 25% of diabetic patients. And these are no ordinary cuts. <clears throat> they take months to heal. They often lead to amputation, and they're deadly. Five-year mortality rates after first ulceration approach 60%. Now, to put that into perspective, breast cancer is deadly too, but mainly due to improvements in early detection, 92% of breast cancer patients are alive after five years. We at Bonbeton want to have a similar success story with the prevention of foot ulcers. Now, fortunately, there's a powerful physiological tool that can be used to predict foot ulcers, temperature. The temperature difference between the red and blue areas in this thermal image of a diabetic patient's feet can indicate an 80% increased chance of them developing a foot ulcer within the next two weeks. And knowing that, my friends, can save lives. And right now, a thermal image can only be taken at a doctor's office, which is not convenient or timely. So what's our solution? a smart insole that simply fits into a patient's shoes, that seamlessly connects to a smartphone app and constantly monitors the foot health of the patient's feet. The data gathered is easily shared among healthcare professionals, caregivers, and patients. And the idea of using skin temperature to predict ulcers has already been proven to reduce ulceration, improve quality of life, and reduce medical costs. Our solution is based on an amazing technology called graphene, a nanomaterial. Our CEO, Lin, has five patents based on his PhD work as part of the first team in the world to demonstrate a flexible temperature sensor based on graphene. 
But what about compliance? If you have trouble putting on your shoes, this could render our whole technology kind of useless. And a lot of people with diabetes do have mobility issues that make it difficult to put on their own footwear. And that's why Lynn partnered with me, the inventor of Quick Kicks, the first fully supportive, totally hands-free, operable footwear. We believe that the use of Quick Kicks and the convenience of it, paired with the smart insoles, can greatly increase compliance and therefore efficacy of the system. And we've already been getting a lot of traction. We've got grants from the NSF and City of New, New York to do a pilot study, and we've got private investment to help us ramp up our progress. And how do we get paid? Well, uh, we plan to use existing reimbursement codes to sell the insoles, shoes, and remote monitoring systems. So, Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We're really looking forward to do a pilot study here in New Orleans. Can you put the cost slide one more time? Which one? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's Steve. Can you talk about uh, possible scalability of uh, the technology across maybe other healthcare sectors or other industries altogether? Sure. Well, um, the patents and the technology based on the thin film sensors can really be applied to all kinds of wearables. Right now, we're targeting specifically the diabetic market and the foot ulcers because we see that as a huge problem and a great first go-to-market strategy. Um, separately from that, I developed the hands-free shoes, which are already on the market for people with mobility challenges. Um, but later on, the technology can be applied to other wearables as well. So d does it require that particular shoe that you make to, to utilize the insert, or can you, we use that in any, any shoe that we have? You can use it in any shoe. Yeah, absolutely. So um, initially, uh, he was, yeah, with, for a pilot testing that was done already, uh, it was done in typical footwear, but uh, Lynn and I went through a business incubator program together and met up and he thought, wow, if you know, a lot of people with diabetes have these mobility challenges, let's hook up and right. you know, combine the products. And, and then the, the, the second part of the question was the impact of socks in terms of detecting the temperature changes. The um, sensors are very accurate and it can read through socks. Steve, considering the, the cost that we're looking at on the, on the screen, what's the comparison, and it doesn't have to be exact, but just as some percentage, of how this compares to what people are doing today with the pinpricks and the other stuff that they're doing? Is it significantly more expensive? Is it still, you know, is it accessible to enough, will it be accessible to enough people? Sure. Well, the standard of care now for diabetic foot ulcer monitoring and um, is basically self-monitoring by the people. They have to uh, put a mirror on the floor and look at the bottom of their feet, right? But they don't see anything, really, until you have an open wound. And by then, it's too late. So the, you know, in order to get a pre-wound diagnosis, they need to go to the doctor's office, and they usually feel their hand for a hot spot, or some of them have the thermal imaging technology. That's the standard of care now, but they have to go to the doctor's office, which, like I said, is not convenient and it's not timely because unless you're going to the doctor's office every week to get monitored, it's too late. So this is continuous monitoring. Um, it's seamless, so the, there's no proactive thing that the patient has to do. It's in your shoe. As long as you're wearing your shoe, it's monitoring the temperature differential, and it'll automatically send an alert to their phone or the healthcare professional or caregiver, whoever you want, and say, hey, you're developing a hot spot. You need to uh, go see your doctor and seek preventative care. I, I can talk about that if you like. Have you, uh, since I'm not familiar with the technology, looked at the false positive rates? So when you, when you do detect yes. that somebody is at a risk to develop this ulcer in, in the next whatever time window, uh, right. how many people actually develop ulcers and how many really not? So really more around the underlying technology yeah, and its so, accuracy. Thank you. That kind of information we plan to bear out in the pilot study. To date, we've just 
done a usability study and a proof of concept to see that the technology works. And the way we're doing it right now, it's looking at a temperature differential between the left and right foot to see that difference and to see it. And it's at different points, uh, co uh, coordinating points on the same foot on each foot. Um, so we're not getting false positives yet, but that'll be part of the pilot study. Any other questions? Just one more. Will this be an FDA 510K type uh, yes, device there are, at some point? Yes, uh, there are two predicate devices now for temperature sensing, um, and, but uh, one of them used kind of a home-based thermometer where they had to touch the foot in multiple points, multiple times a day, and the caregiver would keep a log and all of that. It was very inconvenient. Um, and then there, but it was based on temperature sensing and they had FDA clearance and then there was another one that's used for temperature sensing also in the doctor's office. Just, um, it might be clear to others, but just one more word on your, uh, the reimbursement line versus the consumer line. Sure. Um, so initially we planned to go to market under the, uh, with the insoles under the diabetic footwear program, which allows for three inserts per year. Um, and it's not at that rate, it's at a lower rate. But that's the initial model we plan to go to market to get proliferation and g accumulate data and adoption. Um, later on, after we get the clearance and a code for the smart insoles, our expectation is to have about $249 of reimbursement. And then we're also thinking that there's a possibility to sell it direct to consumer kind of as a, a self-monitoring device at $99. Do you think these, obviously it's adding cost to the system, um, but there's a benefit. Uh, if it starts, uh, you start manufacturing it at scale, millions of uh, yes. uh, folks, what would be the low cost point likely? Will it come down by a log or, or by 50% or whatever? Yes, so um, we're having, uh, our smart insoles made now in anticipation of a pilot study to start this summer. Um, and the cost is very high. It's on the order of $250 per pair. Um, but just at 10,000 pieces, it's going to go to about $40. And at 100,000 units, it's going down to 5 to $8. So as we scale, it will be significant cost reductions. Thank you very much. Please give it up for Bond and Tom. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. My name is Chun Yang. Uh, I've been part of the uh, Emory Healthcare and uh, Atlanta VA diabetes research team for the last seven years. Uh, just two years ago, I co-founded Diasys with a goal of simplifying diabetes management using modern digital tools. Uh, today, we're 28 people strong, post-revenue, and Medicare is actually reimbursing our providers for using uh, our solution. Here's how we do it. Uh, we start with a very simple patient app after they download it, connect it with their healthcare team. All they have to do is push the big blue button right here. Get this little screen, punch in their blood sugar level, for example, 115. Indicate when, let's say it's before lunch right now, pretty straightforward. And that's really all they have to do. Really simple, right? Patient could see his sugars from morning to night. It will highlight trends, highs, lows, averages. And the last thing they could do is also see their diabetes medications. For example, this patient is on metformin twice a day, one long-acting insulin shot uh, at night, as well as mutatime insulin three shots a day. Now, all of this gets transmitted and is referenceable on the provider app, which I'm showing right now. Here, the care team has access to one screen, one very simple screen, where we put all the data together, and they're able to make a quick, safe, and effective decision. Start with the patient demographics, the labs, the kidney function, which is important for renal dosing. We'll show the A1C trends and the self-monitored bl blood glucose trends, patient's meds. And here's the cherry on top. We'll actually provide recommendations for what needs to be done based on all the guidelines out there as well as the FDA labels. For example, sugars are high in the morning, so we'll make a recommendation for increasing the lantus at night. Sugars are a little low at lunch, so we'll say, hey, maybe you want to cut back on the Novolog in the morning to help prevent hypoglycemia. Care team can make any tweaks, send it to the patient, which will pop up on their app, and they'll also get a nice little EMR summary note, which saves a lot of documentation, time, and admin work. Pretty cool. 
Not surprisingly, you make it easy for providers, and especially with a financial incentive, uh, providers are going to do more for the patient, patients are going to get better, and they're going to stay better. Here's one of our studies. Uh, one of our veterans in the program, sugar started high, uh, diocese made some recommendations, care team did it, sugar started going down. Sugars was not at goal yet, so let's go ahead and add a new drug, but let's add it safely. In this case, it was insulin. Let's go ahead and cut back on some of the other doses to help prevent hypoglycemia. You can see the sugars fall beautifully. Make any more adjustments, and you basically retain the same results. Tight, tight control for the rest of the year. Pretty cool. You do this on your population, you see A1C results that look just like this. And last but not least, we help prevent hypoglycemia, keeping it at a bare minimum, which helps prevent those costly, costly ED visits and hospital readmissions. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions now. It's a great presentation. Uh, I have a question about your integration points. Uh, so you'd mentioned usability with uh, providers and electronic medical records. Um, how does the tool work with their, do you have any um, thoughts about that? Yeah, we actually built the tool with a mindset of integrating into EHRs. Uh, obviously the EHRs are pretty fragmented out there. At Emory and the VA, we use Cerner and Vista, so we built the tools specifically to be integratable with those tools. As we evolved, we started looking at Athena, Greenway, Epic as well, which Oshner, I believe, uses. Uh, and we basically uh, typically work close one-on-one -on -one with each individual IT department to pinpoint the key integration points to make sure it's solid. However, with the recognition that there are lots of independents out there that might not have uh, solid IT teams like an Oshner does, what we actually did was make this easy enough to be usable without an EMR integration. That was actually our first point. It's very easy to use. There, weren't, there aren't a lot of integration points. A lot of this is self-supplied by the patient, as well as the care manager, the care team. And we actually make this you know, just by a standalone application without an EMR integration. This could be easily copied and pasted, which actually saves a lot of time, too. Hope that answers your question. So uh, what are you basing your recommendations from? Uh, typically what we do is we'll pull together all of the ACE guidelines, the ADA guidelines, a lot of scientific papers that we track. Uh, you know, this is basically our bread and butter of what, the bread and butter of what we do at the Atlanta uh, VA as well as the uh, Emory Healthcare Diabetes Clinical Research Team. Uh, we're one of many sites for the GREAT study as well as many uh, large NIH funded studies. We take uh, into account all of the different FDA labels as well and we'll typically work with the drug companies too to make sure that all of the guidelines are all the recommendations are pretty solid. So we don't make stuff up. So I guess along that question, if you are, if there are changes in other recommendations, new medications, y'all are gonna be the ones who manage updating the software across the board for everybody? A absolutely. For example, recently Ozempic just came out from Nova Nordisk. We just added that a couple of weeks ago. So we're absolutely on top of everything and we'll keep uh, tabs on what comes out and what goes off market. And currently we do this for every single diabetes drug in the market right now. And you also get a little teaser. Uh, if you look at some valleys up there, we're actually working on our hypertension as well as hyperlipidemia support too. All on one platform. John, on the, um, the, the recommendations there, those are recommendations, right? They uh, the, have to be carried out by the physicians. So Absolutely. So you feel like you're fully compliant with the Absolutely. unlicensed practice of medicine rules? Absolutely. Um, you know, our philosophy right now is the care should be in the hands of the providers. Uh, ultimately, we only know so much about the patient, so it's typically very challenging to take into consideration any other patient factors that might be important for rendering care. So our philosophy was to basically make it easy for the care team to do so, make any adjustments as needed. We'll provide references to all the guidelines, basically where the recommendations are coming from. They could tweak it if they want, and then basically send it on to the patient. So um, a question about patient compliance. Yep. Uh, clearly, a lot of these applications, they struggle from that. When, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, patients are very motivated in the beginning, and then they get tired of it, and they stop putting data in. Yeah. There's also fatigue on the physician end when they are bombarded with so much information. What has been your experience so far in clinical trial settings? And... Uh, uh, do you think you have uh, a way to keep both sides incentivized appropriately? To, Absolutely. To um, you know, we've studied clinical inertia for a very long time. We're actually the group that coined that term. Um, 
you know, what essentially came out of this was uh, there are a couple of secret ingredients to making providers as well as patients more compliant. And from a provider standpoint, it typically comes down to make it easy for me and make it worthwhile for me. And when we tried to tackle the first part of it, this is where we came up with the tool. This is exactly, and we worked with a lot of physicians at Emory Healthcare as well as the Atlanta VA to come up with a very simple tool for the care teams. The next step was make it worthwhile for me. Why should I do this? Well, it not only improves care, but when we started the company, we actually went on to uh, CMS and we said, please, please, please reimburse for this. Here's why, here's the ROI, here are the results we're generating. By helping uh, provide some financial incentives, we keep providers using it. And on the patient side, what we're seeing too is uh, traditionally what you get are patients just pricking their fingers, collecting the data, but frankly, most, uh, most care providers did not really look at that. And that's a big uh, demotivation of a lot of the patients to, is con uh, to continue pricking their fingers. But with something like this, because they are getting the feedback, because they know that the care providers are looking at it, and because they can see so transparently that the numbers are coming down, it's, uh, it really helps. And there's this awesome feedback loop that is created between both patients and providers, which uh, personally, you know, we've seen a lot of solutions struggle with because they only just cater to the patients, and that's it. And, and how often are providers getting feedback? Uh, we scale it, actually. We scale it based on the patient need. And what we'll do is we'll analyze the numbers and the A1Cs. For example, if the patient's A1Cs are pretty high and the nines, sugars are in the 200s, 300s, it might be pretty frequent. It might be once a week or once every two weeks. But once the patient starts to plateau, once the patient starts to get to go, it might be once a month. It might be once every three months so that you can focus your time and the resources into the patient population that is at a larger risk. And we've been able to do just that. Do you find that the patients put in accurate information? I think in the beginning you said that they have to input the data. Is there any protection against wrong? Uh, you know, frankly, not right now. Um, you know, one of the, you know, that exists in current medical practice today. Uh, trust me, I've worked in the diabetes clinics enough to see that patients are making up numbers in the parking lot, right? Um, but, you know, our first approach was actually just to make things easy right now. And as we uh, take this to market, you know, most of the time patients would put in accurate numbers. If anything, you know, they would kind of make their numbers look a bit lower, which is actually okay. As long as they think that these values are good, we actually capture them pretty accurately and help address hypoglycemia as well. So over time, you know, we obviously match this with the A1Cs, you know, just to make sure that it's pretty accurate. For the most part, we are seeing that patients are pretty compliant and accurate so far. But you're right, you know, as we, you know, uh, get more and more patients, we'll start to get some of these nuances, which we'll uh, slowly address. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up, two quick integration questions. Any uh, thoughts around integrating with uh, glucose monitors and then your med list down there with either um, PBMs, EMRs, other sources? Of Ooh, absolutely. So one of the things we're working on, uh, typically putting together the providers and the payers in the same room, uh, one of, and one of the recommendations I'm not showing on the screen right now is actually uh, when a patient is, for example, maxed out on metformin, what do you do? You got all these different choices out there. You got 12 different classes of meds. You got GLP-1s, DPP-4s. We'll put everything all in one place, but the missing thing that we're having right now is the actual cost to the patient. That's something we're working on right now, serving up the actual copay information at the point of care to providers so they could make the right choice the, right, the first time. Uh, the second question about glucose meter integration, absolutely, it is on our roadmap. The unfortunate thing is that the prevalence, the use of these smart meters in the patient populations right now, it's not very high. So that's why we put it on the back burner for now. Once more and more patients start using these smart meters, absolutely. Thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. At this point, our judges will now retreat to make some very difficult decisions. I think we're at that time where we've got a, uh, I think the judges have you collectively, without killing each other, determine a winner? Okay, if I can ask two very distinguished doctors, Dr. Vindale Washington and Dr. Richard Milani, if they would come up. And they're actually going to, uh, they're actually gonna announce the winner. So I'll turn it over to them. Okay. Uh, well, I can tell you that uh, the, the judges got together and felt that uh, all three were excellent. Uh, and I think the, uh, the separation between them were in the fractions. 
Um, so let me just start off by congratulating all three. We think you all did an outstanding job. But we felt it was important to uh, arrive at a first place winner. Uh, and again, as a reminder to everyone, the first place winner will receive prize money of $36,000 and then as well as the opportunity to partner uh, with Oshner and Blue Cross Blue Shield in, in, a, in a pilot study to be able to test the, the product. So with that being said, Vindel, you want to announce the winner? Sure, I'd like to uh, really again thank folks for participating and the winner of the first NOLA High Challenge will be the folks from Altergy. Please come up. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. This really is going to mean a lot. We're going to do some, I like to do some clinical trials and make it happen, you know? Good. All right. We'd love Great. to have you Thank participate you. with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. One more time on the shake. Oh, perfect. It was unbelievable. I am so, so honored to, uh, to be selected, and I look forward to working with the people in New Orleans. What are your next steps now? Uh, we're going to be meeting with uh, the various uh, care, health care providers, as well as Blue Cross Blue Shield and others here that could help us uh, move the company forward and get this uh, product tested and out to, the, to market as soon as possible. How valuable is this to you and other entrepreneurs? This is, this is really extremely valuable. This is the kind of traction that makes the difference. How valuable is a pitch uh, program like we're seeing here today? Oh, it's tremendously valuable, uh, particularly because it's sponsored by partners like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana and Ashner Health. So we're really looking to do uh, pilot studies with health systems like that. Okay, now I don't think... Area. Oh, absolutely valuable. Uh, entrepreneurs can definitely learn from something like this, complement the solution. Diabetes is a huge problem that necessitates a lot of diverse uh, solutions out there. And so, you know, while we're not really here to, uh, while we're here to try to fix diabetes for the 30 million uh, Americans with it, uh, I'm sure we're not able to fix it all for everyone. So I'm sure that entrepreneurs in the space would be able to learn from this and hopefully uh, share the dream with uh, addressing diabetes. So they're going to have great new insights into ways of using technology and social determinants to improve care outcomes and uh, we can do this in a much better way through collaboration and partnerships. Blue Cross's mission is to um, really to, to try to make sure that Louisianans are as healthy as they can be. Health and well-being of Louisianans is our core goal. Um, you can imagine that's a tough goal. Louisiana has a lot of challenges. There are a lot of issues in terms of health care. Um, how do we try to make sure that folks all over the state get the type of resources they need? Um, and their concerns may be different in different regions. Um, we feel that the analytics journey has just begun. Most of analytics uh, until now was what we call retrospective analytics, uh, descriptive and retrospective. So we kind of describe what has happened. What happened in the last quarter in finances? How many diabetics do we have? Uh, what was the cost in the last quarter or last year, right? Those are the kind of questions we normally answer. Where we are heading to is use all of this data to be predictive and prospective. So can we predict who's going to become a diabetic before they become diabetic? Can we predict who's going to be hospitalized? Can we predict who's going to be readmitted? Oh, it's wonderful. You know, there's um, there's tremendous capability when um, people with, who care about the community, who have new ideas, who have capability using technology, data, and really want to make life better for people, come together and really try to do something different. That's what this is about. And so I'm really encouraged by the opportunity uh, to work with Blue Cross, to work with some of the entrepreneurs who've submitted their ideas and to try to try to make a difference. I think the, what we are finding is that the data and data types are exploding. So uh, we are actually dealing with lots of data that we have never dealt with before. Um, so for example, in addition to claims data, we add now data from electronic medical records, laboratories, customer service calls, that's natural language, that, that's sort of natural data that's coming from conversations. So it has to be processed through natural language processing. All of that data combined has to be analyzed in innovative ways. 
And the new techniques and technologies that are out there are also very new. I mean, these are, these are technologies made popular by Amazon, Google, uh, et cetera. Uh, really, they're not resident technologies in most of the health insurance companies. So to try to analyze that, innovation challenges are a great way for uh, folks to get involved and help us solve the problems of healthcare. We certainly know how to solve the problems uh, the way uh, conventional data works, but these new types of data combined with new types of artificial intelligence and analytics, analytics is the hard part and here we can use some help. We're creating what's called a healthcare safe blockchain protocol. And what blockchain can do is it can allow data access in healthcare in a brand new way. It's much more efficient, much more, much more secure, and it brings people together that haven't been brought together before. So we're creating this technology that's really safe for healthcare. You can kind of think of it like the internet. Um, so we're creating that infrastructure. Anybody can build applications on it, just like you can go to a website and build applications on that. So we're opening up and creating ecosystem for new innovation in healthcare. There are a lot of uh, things in people's lives now that have switched to digital and, be, and, and empowered patients in other areas of their lives. It's really time for medicine to move that direction. And so the ability for patients to self-manage, to take uh, tools that they use in their daily life and apply them to health is a, is a great opportunity that we see. Our partnership with Blue Cross is so important. You know, we know that in this state, uh, we've got many challenges facing our community from a health perspective. And working together with like-minded partners like Blue Cross, we think we can make a difference. So coming together through this NOLA High challenge and putting out a call to the national entrepreneurial community to bring in new ideas, new thinking of how we can make lives better for our patients and people with diabetes is a good thing. Tell us your reaction to everything that you've seen and heard here today with the, with the pitches by these three folks. Well, we've been really excited about the innovation that have been displayed by our participants. They've really managed to combine this idea of cutting edge technology, but, but the kind of care that we really want for our citizens. And so we're excited about both their efforts and, and look forward to them even moving forward with their designs and innovations. I think it's a tremendous start for our community. I mean, this is a big part of why NILI is such a national and international event. The partnerships with folks like Idea Village, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Louisiana, Oshno Health System, the city of New Orleans. This is incredibly important, tremendous energy, and we look forward to building on this in the future. If people have questions like more information about Blue Cross's efforts in the area of diabetes, what should they do? Well, they should uh, contact us at uh, Blue, Sh Blue Cross Blue Shield, bcbsla.com, and, and there are links on our site for that. But we're really open and looking for ways to interact with the community taking their ideas, and then, of course, if they're members, trying to help keep them healthier.